thank you all. I, am, uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here tonight. Um, Tara is at the week-long retreat and uh, asked me to be a guest speaker, and I was just delighted to be able to be here. So thank you all. Um, I am, uh, tonight I'm going to talk for a while, and then we'll open it to some questions um, and give you a chance to um, ask whatever you want to ask. Uh, well, as Glenn said, I've been a hospice nurse for many years. And often when someone asks me, what do I do? And I say, I'm a hospice nurse. Um, most of the time, the response is that it takes a special person to do that. Um, or how do you do that? You know, it must be a really, uh, a real gift. And uh, what I believe is that we each have the potential to be compassionate caregivers. Each one of us here has that potential. Um, and um, that my compassion hasn't uh, arisen because I'm a hospice nurse. My compassion actually comes from the place of being able to um, face my own suffering. Um, and in order to face your own suffering, it, it, there are skillful ways to do that, and, and we'll talk about that tonight. But um, I'm not really here to teach you about compassion. Uh, I'm here to show you the way uh, to being compassionate caregiver. Um, because there's a natural giving within each of us. Um, and we just need to tap into that, that source, that inner being of compassion. So I just thought what we will really be exploring tonight, I'll just tell you a little bit about what we'll be doing and talking about compassionate caregiving um, and how suffering is the gateway to compassion. Suffering is inherent in life, and it's inherent in death. Uh, there's no difference. Um, when I started my mindfulness practice, it was based on, on being with patients who are dying. But what I've come to understand is there is no difference. In a mindfulness practice, it's in life, and it's in death. It's in dying, it's end of life, it's in everyday, simple, daily living. It's just being present being mindful. And there's skillful ways to do that, and, and we'll talk about that tonight. Um, and I'll share some stories with you as well. So um, I think all of us, as I said, are here because we do have compassion, and we are givers. And I'm just curious, at a show of hands, if there's who here tonight is actually um, actively a personal or professional caregiver. Yeah. And then who in here believes that at some point in their lives they're going to be a caregiver? Yeah. Well, you're in the right place tonight, so we'll talk about that. Um, The Dalai Lama says, if you want to be happy, practice compassion. If you want others to be happy, practice compassion. You notice he says practice. You know, it's not like, oh, it's going to happen. You know, one day I'm not compassionate, and the next day I am. Um, you know, compassion is, it's a natural relationship with what is and what is happening in the moment. It's a natural rela relationship. Um, um, it's, it's really the beauty of an awakened heart. That's, what I, that's the way I see it. Is there's this real beauty and truth to an awakened heart. Um, it's our true nature to be compassionate. Um, it's innate. Yeah. 
It's a wonderful book called The Grace of Dying by Kathleen Dowling Sang. And, and she uses the term vehicle of spirit. You know, this love, this compassion that arises when we come face to face with the suffering in life. We are the vehicles of spirit. Um, and it's a beautiful ride to be that way, to be able to be present with your own suffering and be able to be present with others. Um, it's just this natural giving. Um, being able to, to touch the vulnerability in ourselves and then touch the vulnerability of others. Um, you know, in, in many of you have read Tara Brock's book, Radical Acceptance, and she says, when the pain is deep, the more fully we touch it, the more fully we release ourselves into boundless, compassionate presence, boundless, you know, boundless, compassionate presence. And keeping our gaze on the bandaged place, as Rumi says, allows the light to enter. As we breathe out, we can feel our longing to connect and let go into the immensity of the light. We can surrender into the radiant love we yearn for. Breathing in, breathing out. We hold our pain and let our pain be held in a boundless heart of compassion. I once had the privilege of caring for an elderly woman. This was a number of years ago. And um, she was dying of cancer. Um, and it was a cancer that had been diagnosed early, that she made the decision because of her age and other factors that she decided not to pursue curative measures. So she happened to begin um, with hospice in early stages. Um, and so I had the privilege of caring for her um, for two years, which often surprises people because people think hospice is only the last few days of your life, and which isn't true. Um, and for two years, I was able to visit her just about every week. Um, when I first began my care, my caregiving, um, you know, she would greet me at the door. She was pretty independent. Um, she lived um, by herself. But her daughter, her only child, lived in the area. Um, but she didn't have a lot of needs at the time, and so I didn't see the daughter very often. But of course, the disease progressed, and she started to become more dependent on um, her, her daughter. Uh, much, much more often, um, that she would need care. Greater involvement, more energy required from the daughter. So I was there one day, and sitting at the dining room table, a little small condo that she lived in, um, I was sitting at one end, and the patient was sitting in the middle. Uh, she was just darling. I just loved her. You know, it's just such a, a great time getting to know her. Um, very fortunate. And her daughter was sitting at the other end, just a lovely person as well. And um, in the conversation, the, the patient actually said that she felt that she was a burden to her daughter. She was a burden. And the conversation kept going, and I, I just let, it, I let that go for a minute. But I decided, well, you know, I think I'm going to address that, because I wanted to make it better. I didn't want her to think that she was a burden to her daughter. I wanted to fix it. Um, so I said to both of them, I said, um, you know, I just, I just heard um, your mother say that she felt that she was a burden. Now, see, I thought I knew the answer. I said, I th she, you know, I really think she, you know, she, she thinks she's a burden. And I just wanted to know if you could talk about that a little bit. 
Well, surprisingly, she said, yes, she is a burden. I didn't expect that answer. I wanted her to say, oh, no, she's not a burden at all. I'm really happy to take care of her. It's a pleasure. It's easy. It's, you know, whatever. She said, no, she is a burden. Oh, my gosh. It, 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 um, it was really a defining moment for me to, to, um, to pay attention to. Um, she said, she is a burden. Um, and there are things that I have to do that are really, really hard. And I, um, I'm really struggling with it. But I wouldn't want it any other way. I love my mother. And it's where I want to be. But it's hard. So this vehicle of the spirit and this beauty and grace of compassion is not easy. You can practice compassion, but people are burdens. To be a caregiver is hard work. One of my friends said to me, who is a caregiver, she said, it's not a fairy tale. You know, it's really difficult. Um, there's the paradox. You know, there's the paradox. You know, in order to be in touch with our caregiving, in order to be in touch um, with compassion, we need to touch our own suffering. This daughter spoke the truth. She was in touch with her own suffering. The suffering was, it was a burden. And she was able to speak her truth. Um, and we can be burdened by our own suffering. And we can be burdened by the suffering of others. Um, Stephen Levine suggests that most people begin to open to their life, not because there is joy, because, but because there is pain. Pain often denotes the limit of the territory of the imagined self, the safe ground of the self-image, beyond which a kind of queasiness arises at being in the midst of the uncontrollable. This is our edge our resistance to life, the place the heart closes in self-protection. When you are near your edge, you are near the truth. When you are near your edge, you are near your truth. Share another one. Ken Wilbur, I don't know if you're familiar with Ken Wilbur. He puts it this way. Suffering smashes to pieces the complacency of our normal fictions about reality and forces us to become alive in a special sense. To become alive in a special sense. To see carefully, to feel deeply, to touch ourselves in our worlds in ways which we have heretofore avoided. It has been said, and I truly think, that suffering is the first grace. So how do we make compassionate present real in our lives? How do we do it? You know, how do we practice compassion the way the Dalai Lama speaks of? Practice compassion. How do we become compassionate caregivers? Um, when I started as a hospice nurse in, um, oh gosh, about 14, 15 years ago, um, you know, I, I, I didn't really know what I was getting into. Uh, um, but after about six, seven, eight years, I probably, if somebody had asked me, I would have said that I was a compassionate caregiver. I'm a nurse. I'm taking care of people who are dying. I'm in the midst of their suffering. Um, and I was pretty sure, I, you know, I had the clinical expertise. Um, and then I, I was being compassionate. I could be present in the room with others who are suffering. Um, 
And then I happened to um, attend a workshop that I, I had heard about, and it was a weekend workshop, and it was entitled Compassionate Care of the Dying. Um, and I went to this workshop, and I don't know if you all are familiar with um, the Meta Institute. Um, at the time, it was called ALIA, but it's since changed, the Meta Institute with Frank Ostaseski. And um, I spent two days that weekend at this workshop. And I realized that I could never do hospice the way I'd been doing it. It blew my cover. Totally blew my cover. I had been so familiar with being able to protect myself from other people's suffering. With cliches, with pat answers. I mean, I certainly was caring. but. I really was avoiding suffering because I was not looking at my own suffering. I was avoiding it with these pat answers or these cliches of trying to make other people feel better. Um, that Monday after that workshop, I remember coming to work and I was pretty elated by the workshop, but I was also convinced that I had no choice because there is no choice when you decide that you need to follow the natural path to compassion. There is a commitment to exploration. And when I heard about the Meta Institute, I decided that, okay, I, I have no choice. I don't know if I'm gonna be able to keep working and do this, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna go to the Meta Institute and take this course. Well, it happens to be in San Francisco, and I live here. Um, so I spent a full year traveling once a month out to San Francisco in order to take part in this Meta Institute. Now, it wasn't there to teach me new skills about nursing. It wasn't, you know. Um, it was to um, bring me face to face with the pain and suffering of things that I had avoided for years. Uh, and. Uh, it wasn't easy, you know. Um, I really can't talk about the avoidance of suffering if I don't share with you a little bit about the suffering, about my avoidance. Um, when I was in my, uh, when I was around 18 years old, my older brother um, took his own life and a, definitely a tragedy in our family. And I um, learned very quickly to become silent. It felt shameful, and there was so much grief that I decided that I wanted to avoid it. And I managed to avoid that for many, many years. Um, but I didn't know I was. That's the interesting thing about the avoidance. You, you really become skillful at it. You know, you find ways that um, you just ignore it, you bury it. I'm not going to look at that right now, you know, uh, until I started working with the dying until I took this course. Uh, and Ken Wilber spoke of first grace. Well, this was from tragedy to grace. Um, in order to have this commitment to explore what was going on. Um, because in, in avoiding your suffering, um, you first have to know what it is. What are your, what are your um, habits of avoiding? They're, they're conditioned responses. And you need to name them. You need to be able to say t to yourself, what are the ways I avoid my suffering? So I'd just like to take a minute for a reflection. You, know, you can take a few minutes. Um, put your, you close your eyes. And just, just settle for a moment. And if you can begin to 
doesn't have to be anything that is very painful for you right now. But maybe looking at something that you tend to avoid and bring an awareness to how you avoid. And ask yourself, just say, tell me a way I avoid suffering. Don't try to control the answer or find the answer. Just ask the question. Tell me a way I avoid suffering. You might ask that a few times and see what arises. Again, not trying to judge it and not trying to control the answer. Just an awareness. Tell me a way I avoid suffering. Tell me a way I avoid suffering. Just being mindful of the response each time. And then you can open your eyes. So by naming it, I think if we don't know how we do it, we can't begin to actually get deeper into that place of what the suffering actually is. Um, in my case, when I was, um, the way I avoided suffering was through silence. For many years, if somebody asked me if I had any brothers, I would only say that I had one. I had two brothers. I remained silent. That was my suffering. But I avoided it. The course at Meta brought me face to face with that. I remember at one of the uh, evenings there, we had to um, um, bring a picture of someone who had died that we wanted to um, remember. And I had put my brother's picture on the altar there. And I remember going to bed that night and thinking, you should not have done that. Go down and get that picture. Remain silent. But I left the picture. and began to open up to the suffering and touch it. A little more and a little more. It doesn't have to be fast. And it doesn't have to be overnight. It takes time, practice, compassion. So how do we do it? How do we do it? I'm going to read you a journal, actually. And this was written by, um, actually, it was a hospice chaplain who attended the Meta retreat, and uh, a good friend of mine. And he spent different times up in Alaska, up in the Arctic. And this came from his journal. And I think what he wrote really is, a, uh, is one of the skillful ways we face our suffering. It comes with the imprecise predictability of a northern storm. It hits my head first, expanding, exploding, and raging as the atmospheric pressure drops. 
Then with my eyes, I witness color change. Faint fibers of pink cirrus slowly boil into gray updrafting cumulus, sucking the living warmth from my bones. Soon I am simply drenched, shivering, contracted against the howling day. How many times in this incarnation must I go through these storms? My indig indignation rises up. I worked this one out years ago. Why again? And yet the episodic cycle plummets body, spirit into confusion, fear, and despair. Returning storms, refine, refine, refine. Crystallize, sanctify, legitimize. I want to slip into numbness, desperately desire to sleep. But the thunder shouts, stay awake. My literal and essential survival depends on my ability to stay awake in the midst of this cacophony of experience. The way out is through. Eyes wide open, deeply breathing, heart trembling, knees shaking, welcoming everything. So welcoming everything. You know, it all comes back to mindfulness. It all comes back to being present in the moment. Um, it, it comes back to that in life, and it comes back to that in death. Um, and uh, it's really about just being present in the moment. Um, it's, it's being aware and paying attention. It's asking yourself, what's happening? What's happening now? What's happening inside me? What's happening around me? Um, oftentimes, when I visit patients, I used to go in and see them, how are you? You know, and that kind of question. But I've gotten so it doesn't really, um, I, I find that I ask, what's happening? It serves not only as, as a question to find out what's happening with the patient and with the family, but it also reminds me to pay attention and to be aware what's happening. And then allowing and accepting, an allowance and an accepting of everything, welcome everything, push nothing away. Um, Allowing anger to arise, allowing sadness to be present, allowing joy, allowing the loss of meaningfulness. To stay in the room and don't run away. To cross the threshold into the suffering, to recognize that there is a burden, that there are burdens and don't run away, to speak the truth about it. To stay, yeah. to stay awake, yeah. and stay in the room. It, it's hard to do, but you bring yourself back again and again. It's, very, it's, it's like when we sit and we meditate and we talk about the breath, and we wander off into thought, it's come back again. Come back to your breath. So come back to the moment. Come back to whatever is happening. You may not like it. It may not feel very good, but being aware of every moment that's happening. You don't want to miss them. I remember I had a, a patient one time whose um, uh, wife was so angry um, that she was losing him. That she, and she was a wonderful caregiver, but very angry about the fact that she wasn't going to wake up some mornings and find her husband there anymore. And um, it was hard to be in that room with that anger. It was really hard to stay. 
but you just stay a little bit longer and you stay and be mindful of where it, what's happening to you in your body and what's happening to you in your mind and uh, every sensation and listen. Um, eventually she came to the place where she was able to tell her love story. She was able to tell the story of how they met and the joy in knowing him. The anger moved in to the joy. The anger moved into the love. It's allowing things to be as they are, to cross into that world and stay. It's a poem by Mary Oliver. Some of you may have heard it. Here's a story to break your heart. Are you willing? This winter, the loons came to our harbor and died one by one of nothing we could see. A friend told me of one on the shore that lifted its head and opened the elegant beak and cried out in the long, sweet savoring of its life, which if you have heard it, you know is a sacred thing. And for which you have not heard it, you better hurry to where they still sing. And believe me, tell no one just where that is. The next morning, this loon, speckled and iridescent, and with a plan to fly home to some hidden lake, was dead on the shore. I tell you this to break your heart, by which I mean only that it break open and never close again to the rest of the world. I tell you this to break your heart, by which I mean only that it break open and never close again to the rest of the world. Recently, I was talking to a really dear friend of mine who happens to be um, a nurse and she's been a nurse for 40 years. I've known her since I was a little girl. We've been the best of friends. Um, and over the past couple of years, um, she and her brothers and sisters have been, had been caring for their parents who have since died. Um, her mother died first, um, and then her father. Um, but during the time towards the end of his life, she was one of the primary caregivers in the midst of also working full time. So every weekend she spent from Friday night until Monday morning taking care of her father. He was in his 90s and he was wheelchair bound. He was extremely hard of hearing. Um, he was a impatient, um, an angry at times, frustrated individual. Um, and um, she was telling me the story that, that one, um, what would happen is that he always wanted to get up and get in the wheelchair, but when he got in the wheelchair, he wanted to put on his shoes. And um, he could not feel his feet anymore, nor could he reach his feet. Nor could he tell when she was putting him on because of, he had no feeling in his feet. So she would have to get down on her knees every morning after hoisting him up into the side of the bed and put on his shoes. But as she was putting on his shoes, trying to get them on, he was trying to put them on. 
She was getting angry, frustrated, trying to push them on. He was getting angry, frustrated, and was yelling at her. Put my shoes on. And she's trying to put his shoes on. She thought at one point, it doesn't, why is this so difficult? This shouldn't be this difficult to put shoes on. You know? Why is this such an ordeal? This is what she wrote me. It happened in a flash. I thought, let go. You are resisting this, this serving him, this whole thing. Let go of control of this. In that moment, that was the defining moment. And this defining moment carried into other things I was able to do for him, other actions with him and for him, including my ability to treat myself with kindness and compassion, and the ability to treat him with kindness and compassion. I recognize this sustained energy to control. When I was able to admit to my own resistance, this resistance, this wrangling with him, I realized that it's not the shoes. It's everything the shoes symbolize about being servant to him. He was so impatient. He had, in, he had even told me many times that he was ready to die. And I had thought to myself, you are not going anywhere until you're patient. <laughs> then I recognized and accepted that I needed to be patient. I recognized and accepted that I needed to let go, not him. I realized I was creating my own second arrow. It was only through skillful means, through mindfulness and conscious choice, to be present in that moment, to be present in that moment of putting on his shoes, <coughs> did things change. Things begin to change when we begin to um, look at the limits of our ability to be compassionate, to be compassionate, when we look at our limits and when we look at the ways that we are encouraged to be compassionate, what encourages to us to be compassionate and what limits us from being compassionate. And the skillful ways to do that are mindfulness and presence, being mindful, accepting, being aware, accepting things as they are, welcoming everything and pushing nothing away. Thich Nhat Hanh says, our true home is in the present moment. The miracle is not to walk on water. The miracle is to walk on the green earth in the present moment. The miracle is to walk on the green earth in the present moment. The truth is, you already have everything you need. You just need to go inward. You just need to be present with what is. You already have everything you need. I'm just showing you the way. Mm. 
and I can't let tonight go by without reading another poem. And I, you've heard this one before, probably, some of you. Um, but it's, it's Kindness. It's Kindness by Naomi Shihab Nye. Before you know what kindness really is, you must lose things. Feel the future dissolve in a moment, like salt in a weakened broth. What you held in your hand, what you counted and carefully saved, all this must go so you know how desolate the landscape can be between the regions of kindness. How you ride and ride thinking the bus will never stop. The passengers eating maize and chicken will stare out the window forever. Before you learn the tender gravity of kindness, you must travel where the Indian in a white poncho lies dead by the side of the road. You must see how this could be you, how he too was someone who journeyed through the night with plans and a simple breath that kept him alive. Before you know kindness as the deepest thing inside, you must know sorrow as the other deepest thing. You must wake up with sorrow. You must speak to it till your voice catches the thread of all sorrows and you see the size of the cloth. Then it is only kindness that makes sense anymore only kindness that ties your shoes and sends you out into the day to mail letters and purchase bread. Only kindness that raises its head from the crowd of the world to say, it is I you have been looking for, and then goes with you everywhere like a shadow or a friend. We sit for a minute, and close our eyes. And close this evening with just the just knowing that you have everything you need. That through compassionate presence, you can bring attention and awareness to what is and allow and accept things to be as they are. You can open your heart let your heart break open and open your heart some more with kindness, without resistance, without judgment, with a natural relationship with what is compassion. 